As time moved on, First German Baptist Church outgrew its small space. In need of a bigger church building, members built a new church that was finished and dedicated in 1891. This would have been a celebratory time, full of excitement as the church congregation was growing and the Word of God was being preached. On June 21st, 1891, the new building was dedicated. Reverend Gubelman of the church gave the dedicatory address and Brother Albert the prayer of dedication. With plans to sell the old church property in order to finance the new building, things seemed to be looking promising for the future of the church. Instead of smooth sailing and an easy future, purchasing the new church brought with it a season of instability and reliance on the provision of God. Very shortly after the dedication of Dayton's Bluff Baptist Church, a financial depression hit the country. The plans the church initially had in selling the old church building fell to pieces. The church was now in an overwhelming amount of debt that proved to be a heavy burden on the pastors that followed. The old building would not be sold for another 15 years after the completion of Dayton's Bluff, and even then, only for about half of the initial price. These kinds of unfortunate events can lead to the downfall of the church, especially one in the middle of transitioning, as was Dayton's Bluff. However, the members of Dayton's Bluff refused to lie down and take what was happening. Members of the congregation met regularly in order to find various ways of making the mortgage payments and staying afloat. While Satan may have intended on the sinking of our Baptist church, God used it as an opportunity to strengthen our congregation together. Amidst the prayer and necessary fortitude of these times, Reverend Herman Cause took over the pastorship as he sought to guide the congregation through the trying times they were in. It was under his pastorship that the congregation began to rise out of the heavy burden of debt that they had felt trapped under new light seemed to be dawning on the horizon. The next few years were marked by a transitional time that saw several pastors come and go. Transition seemed to be constant, and with a church that had gone through so much on the path to unity as a body, they still were lacking a leader of a more permanent position. In 1907, after two calls from the Dayton's Bluff Church to the Iowan Stokeman household, Reverend C. F. Stokeman accepted the call to Dayton's Bluff and made plans to move his family to the area. In a time in which the church needed stability, Reverend Stokeman brought stability. There were ups and downs in his 20 years of ministry to the church, but through it all, a foundation of Jesus brought the church through. Reverend Stokeman's ministry was characterized especially by its length, but also by the pastor's friendly and interested spirit. Stokeman was often referred to as a family pastor. He not only acted as the pastor for the congregation, but also as a physician, lawyer, counselor, advisor, and comforter. Stokeman blessed the congregation with his care and love, but also kept the congregation in check by leading a strict policy of removal from the church should Christian principles not be followed. Reinstatement was given upon repentance by those who were removed. The congregation flourished under Stokeman, and the membership more than doubled during his time in leadership. It was around this time that the First World War was entered by the United States of America. It would have been easy at that time to create a wall of division in the church. However, Stokeman and Dayton's Bluff welcomed German-speaking refugees and brought them into the church fold. Under Reverend Stokeman's leadership, the congregation continued to grow and progressed until one fateful day. On September 17, 1926, C. F. Stokeman's wife quickly and suddenly died. Heavily distraught by this, Reverend Stokeman read a letter of resignation to the church on January 16th of the following year. This letter was eventually accepted at a later date. Reverend C. F. Stokeman proved to be an incredible example of our church's motto itself, a caring family. He strove to be self-sacrificial, caring, and a beacon of hope to those who had none. His incredible dedication and passion for his congregation served the church for 20 years before he stepped down, and we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for his leadership. In 1929, after the fallout of the First World War, the United States dipped into an economic depression never before seen and never seen since. The Great Depression left many American families desperate for a means to survive, in which the church at Dayton's Bluff was not exempt from. There were many times when my siblings and I 
had to borrow clothes from other people. After my mother still died, my father Sam could not afford to take care of us and my two sisters and I had to live with other people. A lot of the people from church, some of my relatives, we stayed with for a couple weeks because my dad had to work and my mother was gone. Following Reverend Stokeman's step down was a minister by the name of F.P. Cruz. Cruz took the helm of the church's leadership and brought with him a reasonable amount of Christian growth and gradual progress. Soon after he took over, Cruz found himself in leadership of a church during this exact Great Depression. Things that were once basic purchases now required a great deal of effort in purchasing. Rugs, kitchen equipment, books, and many other odds and ends needed money to be raised. In spite of this tumultuous time, however, God continued to provide in various ways and bring the church through. However, a few years after the Great Depression, Rev. F. P. Cruz resigned from the church due to poor health. After six months of searching for a new pastor, A. G. Schlesinger accepts the call to become the new pastor of Dayton's Bluff. Schlesinger leads the congregation in participating in a church census with a focus and an effort in reaching the unchurched and bringing salvation to them. Schlesinger used the Great Depression as an opportunity not just to meet the needs of his congregation, but also to those outside of the congregation, as the Northwestern Association was allowed to use the church building to provide meals for those who had need at 25 and 30 cents apiece. In 1936, after five years of faithful leadership, Schlesinger accepted the call to another church. As the Great Depression began to lift in 1938, a new heart and mind swept through the church. After years of struggling to make ends meet, the congregation began to feel a new and powerful calling to do the Lord's work. During this revival, Laura E. Redding, a member of the church congregation, is called to Cameroon as a missionary. Laura was a devoted Christian missionary, bringing the gospel to many people. She spoke frequently in a church. When she came back from the mission field, she was a blessing to all of us. Her passion for her calling led many others to follow her to Cameroon, and she became the first recorded missionary sent to another country by our first German Baptist church. Redding's work was fruitful, and the church felt strongly about her as a missionary. A Laura Redding Missionary Day was organized and held in which $900 was raised for her work. This may not seem like much, but at the time, it would have been equivalent to almost $16,000 today. The dedication of the church congregation towards Laura Redding's mission is an example of the importance that was and is emphasized in missions. Dayton's Bluff and Redeemer today saw the importance of proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth and saw to it to advance the cause of those who were doing so. A few pastors came and went, but it was Reverend John Wackup who would find himself in pastorship when the next American crisis took place, World War II. Wackup would not only have to face the physical consequences of war, but also the spiritual consequences as well. My brother had a paper route in the, in the city and during this, the Second World War, families that had sons in the military posted a, a small white flag in the window of their home. And if they had two sons, there would be two of those flags, or three, depending on how many from that family were in the service. If a son was killed, they were given a gold star to put in that window. I reflect back as a little kid how many of those gold stars were in windows on the east side. I mention that from the standpoint that the neighborhood church was such a stable place in that time of, of great worry and great concern. And the churches were filled and were uh, praying and asking the Lord to bring this uh, terrible war to, uh, to an end. Though trying times sought to tear down the church, Walker persisted in his ministry of the gospel and the word of God. When I was a child, our pastor was Reverend Walker, and he also, along with being a very evangelistic preacher, he had a good voice, so he would sing and be moved to tears. 
He had a booming voice. He was a very strong preacher. Before he became our pastor, he was involved with the St. Paul Association of Evangelicals. As a boy, I remembered him preaching in the pulpit with his strong voice. I do remember as a child hearing a lot about the Lord's return, much more than in later years. It was really a strong emphasis that the Lord was coming back. Walk Up would direct the congregation in a variety of ways in support of the American side of the war. When the end finally came, Walk Up organized a victory banquet for the men and women who were in service for their country. Well, when it ended, everyone was in the streets marching and it was on the radio and all over the TV. And we rode around in my dad's Model T car with some of the other people in downtown St. Paul. I mean, it was a happy, happy time. In 1948, the church celebrated its 75th anniversary. As a church that had gone through two world wars and the Great Depression in those 75 years, you can imagine the tone in which that celebration carried. What it seemed like impossible times, God had used as an example of his goodness and provision. I go back to the old Dayton's Bluff Church. Other than being at home with my family, there wasn't any other place on earth that I would rather have been than at that church. It really meant a tremendous amount to me in establishing me in the faith, building me up, giving me a real strong spiritual fellowship home. It was uh, really great. Even when I got kicked out of my Sunday school class and had to go sit in the choir loft in the shame seat. But uh... <laughs> one of the things that I recall is our fellowship hall. There wasn't room for any more people than there. It was filled wall to wall. It was a wonderful experience to be a part of the Dayton's Wealth Baptist Church congregation. Of those who came together that day, one person had witnessed this provision since the beginning of the church. Mrs. Henry Spicer Sr., who was 10 at its founding. A communion was taken as the congregation reminisced and thanked God. It was a special occasion. Everyone came and spoke about the church and the building, how it was going up every day. There was always something new added. And we knew Mrs. Spicer well. She lived on the farm on Highway 61. And I remember her being in her home several times because we just lived across the highway onto another street. She was a lovely Girl. Six years later, in 1954, after 63 years of living in the Dayton's Bluff Church building, God was once again thanked as the church participated in a mortgage-burning celebration. The congregation at Dayton's Bluff once again turned their eyes heavenward and praised the Father for his innumerable blessings. In 10 years, new land was purchased, and in 1969, the church started groundbreaking for a new building under a new name. Redeemer Baptist Church.